Thank you everyone for joining us for our special Tuesday mm -hmm. webinar uh, for uh, Native American Heritage Month. We are incredibly excited to be joined by Ricardo Cate, uh, who's going to talk to us and, and show us some of his art and talk about art and activism. Before we get started, I just wanted to uh, do a couple of our, of our introductory, our opening statements. Uh, we always start every webinar and, and our meetings with our land acknowledgement because our archaeological center, our campus here, um, is on sits on the traditional homelands of the Pueblo, Ute, Paiute, Diné, and Hickoria Apache. Uh, we, we work here, we live here, and we always want to acknowledge that history of, of our landscape. We also want to acknowledge that what we do here at Crow Canyon, our mission in the world, uh, is not at all possible without indigenous people in the past, present, and future. We recognize and honor ancestral and descendant indigenous communities for their contributions to all humankind, and in particular, their contributions uh, to us and allowing us to, to do our work here at Crow Canyon. We are grateful to all indigenous people and support the preservation and protection of cultural traditions, ancestral connections, and sacred lands, which leads into our mission of, of Crow Canyon Archaeological Center for going on 40 years now uh, to empower present and future generations by making the human past accessible and relevant through archaeological research, experiential education, and American Indian knowledge. As you watch our Zoom presentation, um, I know everybody's pretty familiar with Zoom, but we will have, um, a, I think actually, we're not gonna have a PowerPoint so much after this, uh, but Ricardo is gonna be talking to us. So you shouldn't really need to move your screen, but if, if you need to um, uh, adjust the, the heads versus what's in the background, you can uh, find the bar uh, to the right of the screen and just drag it over. If you're joining us uh, on Zoom and you have any difficulties, you can head over to our live stream on Facebook and you can always watch us after the fact by subscribing to our YouTube channel. Uh, we've got a lot of fantastic webinars for Native American Heritage Month. Uh, next week, uh, we have um, on Thursday, Dr. Alexandra Jones with Archaeology Education as Redress, highlighting archeology span and community education programs. And then on the following week, on Thursday the 18th, we have Indigenizing Archaeology and Museums with our good friend here at Crow Canyon, uh, Dr. Woody Aguilar. Uh, as we talk about on all of our webinars, uh, COVID-19 has been um, particularly destructive uh, in uh, indigenous communities, in the communities of our native uh, friends and partners and scholars. And uh, if you'd like to, to uh, make a contribution to any of these funds, there are some listed here. Uh, the Pueblo Relief Fund, Hopi Relief Fund, uh, Navajo and Hopi Families. The, the official Navajo Nation Relief Fund. So if you want, you can just snap a picture of these or uh, let us know afterwards and we'll make sure that you get this information. So without further uh, ado uh, from me, I would like to, um, it is really my honor to introduce Ricardo Cate. Uh, and we are incredibly fortunate that he has, has joined us today. Uh, Ricardo is of, the San, of Santo Domingo Pueblo. I, I've read a little bit, uh, some other interviews uh, with Ricardo today, and uh, one of the introductory descriptions I liked was uh, artist, cartoonist, um, uh, 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 dad, a marine veteran, farmer, seventh and eighth grade uh, school teacher. Um, he draws, as I know everybody knows, uh, without reservations, the only native cartoon that appears in a mainstream newspaper as a daily and has appeared in the Santa Fe, New Mexican since October of 2007. Uh, one, of the, one of the quotes that, that I read from Ricardo earlier today was, uh, without humor, we'd all be crying all the time, which uh, we, we definitely believe that around here at Crow Canyon. And, and with that, I'd just like to say thank you so much for joining us and turn it over to you. Okay, thanks. I almost forgot to unmute myself. Um... <laughs> Well, I'm glad to be here. Um, uh, as we were setting up, I was still um, trying to winter, winters, winter nice, winter, prepare for winter. For uh, I was out chopping wood and stacking wood and doing all kinds of other stuff because um, my kids aren't here. I have three kids. And uh, so I, I was uh, out there doing, I love being outdoors. I love, you know, uh, I know my job 
requires me to sit at the desk and uh, paint or draw or whatever, but uh, I love being outside, being active most of the time. So anyway, um, I'm glad to be here. Um, well, uh, here is a, is a kind of a weird term now because here is in my house. I'm glad to be here in my house, but, <laughs> but joining you guys, I mean, on this uh, thing that makes me look like, feel like I'm in the Brady Bunch because, you know, remember the Brady Bunch. Um, <clears throat> so, um, yeah, art and activism. I, uh, I've been drawing since I was uh, age 11 uh, here on the reservation, going to school up here at the, the, the reservation, which I wound up teaching at, um, uh, uh, as Liz has said, um, teaching seventh, eighth grade social studies of all subjects. Um, it was it was my favorite subject. And so uh, um, <clears throat> anyway, um, I was talking to Rebecca as we were setting up and and uh, she is uh, she knows about the, the school in uh, Ignacio, which used to be a boarding dormitory back until 1981. Uh, then uh, because of Reaganomics, the, the school or the dormitory shut down. And uh, it was just before my senior year. So I was able to uh, be up there uh, my sophomore and freshman, uh, fresh, no, sophomore and junior year. Um, and that was that was high school back then. It was 10th, 11th, and 12th, and 9th wasn't included. This, this goes way back uh, to 1979. So uh, anyway, uh, <clears throat> that boarding dormitory is uh, uh, about 250 miles from my house. And so I couldn't understand why my dad wanted me and my brother to attend this school 250 miles from my house when we could have just gone to Bernalillo or Santa Fe Indian School, which are only 30 miles away. We could, you know, uh, be bused back and forth. But I later found out that uh, he wanted us, he wanted to force us to learn English because up in Ignacio, we made up one quarter of the population because uh, it is a dormitory, uh, uh, dorming uh, uh, place. And so the natives that were there, which consisted of about maybe 200 Navajo, about 150 Southern Ute kids and about 50 Apache. And there was only uh, four of us Pueblos. And so uh, if you know your history, all those tribes are, are enemy tribes from way back when. So I always thought it was my dad's idea of a sick joke to, to put us in that um, setting. But anyway, <clears throat> um, so uh, the, the kids from, from the dormitory were bused to a school that was only a mile away in the town of Ignacio. And like I said, we made up three quarters of the, one quarter of the uh, population. And um, I, at that time, at age 15, I hadn't really uh, spoken English very much because when we went into town, it was my dad that ordered the pizza or whatnot um, or dealt with uh, uh, ordering for us and stuff. And so, um, and at school, we didn't really talk to uh, the teachers, which were uh, about 99% of them were white. And so uh, we didn't like speaking English and we always got punished for talking in our language. And uh, because the teachers thought we were talking about them, which we were, but that's beside the point. Anyway, <laughs> I, um, <clears throat> and so he sent us to the school. And uh, I remember getting dropped off and uh, in, this, in this strange environment at this dormitory, first of all. And uh, my dad um, gave me this watch. Uh, this little, the only thing he ever given me was this little Timex watch. And, uh, and so I really wanted to protect that watch and not lose it or anything. And so uh, when I joined the football team, which uh, by the way, I, I knew nothing about football at the time. I mean, absolutely nothing. I had never even watched the game back then. And so, uh, but I joined because my brother who's older, two years older was one of the stars of that team. And so I went to join first of all, so I wouldn't have to be at the dorms. And second of all, I got to be with my brother and I got to watch him, you know? And so, uh, and so um, I, I, I had this watch, but then they told us that um, not to put locks on our lockers uh, to instill some 
trust um, among the players, but I didn't trust anyone. And so I was trying to figure out where to put this uh, watch. And so I was like thinking, uh, okay, well, and I was looking and then I had put on my shoulder pads and here you, you tie the shoulder pads right here for some of you guys who played football before. And then I thought, oh, I'm going to put the watch right there. And so I, so I uh, uh, attached the watch to my shoulder pads because then I put on this practice jersey that came down to here and you couldn't see the watch. And so there I was out there on the field and uh, I never got to play ever. I mean, I did the, the exercises we do for like 20 minutes before practice. And then I would just stand on the sidelines for the next six hours. And so here I was, um, it's, a, it's a Saturday morning practice. It was been two weeks into the school year and uh, I hadn't spoken to any of the white kids yet, uh, simply because I used to talk like this with this heavy exit and people make fun of me. So, so I didn't want to speak English to anyone, any of the white kids. And uh, well, the other Navajo uh, Southern Ute Apache kids, uh, they had the same accent, so it didn't matter. And uh, when we got to the school, we used to be up, uh, stand up against the wall because we didn't want to mingle with, the, with all the other kids. And so they used to call the Indian dorm students wallpaper because we would just stand up against the wall and watch everything in life go by, you know? And so uh, <clears throat> I always thought that was interesting. Anyway, two weeks into the school year, I'm standing uh, out in the football field with this watch, jersey over it, hadn't spoken to any of the white kids yet. And uh, there's a break in, in, uh, uh, in practice. And so I'm standing there and I'm standing right by this water uh, jug and uh, I, saw, I see six uh, kids and I recognize them as my classmates, six white kids walking towards me. And they're talking, pointing towards the, the water jug and I'm just standing there right next to it. And then I start picking up their conversation. They're going, oh man, how long have we been out here in practice? And one of them says, I don't know. I don't know how long we've been out here. And then, and then uh, one of them says, what do you think time, when, when do you think practice is over? I don't know. And just when they got there, one of them said, I wonder what time it is. And this bell gall goes off in my head, right? And so I turn around, I look down at my shirt and it's 1047. So I take a step closer because here's my chance <clears throat> to say something to, to, to these kids. I, for two weeks, I've been wanting to talk to you know, one of the kids, but I was too afraid. And so I go, <clears throat> it's 1047. And they all turned to me and go, what? And I was like nervous. I go, oh, it's 1047. And they go, how do you know? And then one of the kids said, oh, look, he's Indian. He can tell time by the sun. And they all got excited. Really, really, can you do that? And I was so nervous. I had no choice but to go, uh, yeah. And so, <laughs> and so they walked off amazed and I'm standing over there going, oh my gosh, you know, what, what have I done here, right? And so uh, fast forward to Monday, uh, Monday afternoon after school, and uh, I'm standing by uh, the water jug again, practice. I'm, I'm not playing. I got the watch and everything. <clears throat> and there's another break in, uh, in practice. And I see those same six kids walking towards me with about six, eight other white kids. And they're all pointing towards me. And they're walking across the field. So I turned around and I looked down and I go, oh. 432, 432. And they walk up to me and they go, hey, Indian. I said, what? He said, what time is it now? And I went, it's 432. And one of them had a watch. He goes, oh my gosh, he's right. He's right on top, on the dot. And they were all excited, walked away. And they were like, oh yeah, I've seen that in the movies. They can do that. They can even hear stuff, you know, that's come, coming towards them. And I was like, oh my gosh. And so the whole season, I had to be ready for any time someone came up to me or came towards me, ready to, to tell the time. And uh, I thought that was kind of an important story, first of all, because Rebecca knows the area and I wanted to tell that story. And second, uh, it's, it's, it's a big part of my life where uh, even though I told this little white lie, I, uh, it got my foot in this, this uh, crazy world they call the dominant society. And uh, 
And mind you, yes, you know, I was 15 at the time, and it's a, it, you know I could have easily gotten culture shock. But one of the other things my dad left me was with is, and this is kind of big because of what I'm about to talk about, is that um, he knew I was nervous, he knew I was scared, and he was never really uh, he was pretty rough on me. Uh, he wasn't. Uh, we didn't share very many tender moments, but. Uh, this was one of them. He he knew I was very nervous. So he puts his hand on my shoulders and he says, I know you're scared, you know, and I won't see you again till Christmas. And this was in August. I won't see you again till Christmas during the break. But, but uh, I just wanted to tell you that uh, basically the same thing your grandpa told me when he dropped me off at Haskell. And he says, uh, everything you want, need to know about these people white people is in books it's in uh movies films um videos we didn't have videos at the time um but uh everything you need to know about them uh, is out there and you can learn about them anything and everything but they know nothing about you and that is your weapon and for some reason that made me feel really good that made me feel like uh i, I was i had on this this, this, uh, this invisible cloak like uh, like in harry potter and i could do and you know i could uh i don't know just be amongst them and not really be uh noticed and and i just stepped back and and i studied this new culture and it was kind of cool um and then just a couple of weeks later i was ready to immerse myself in this and that's when I came up with that watch thingy, and uh, yeah, it's been it's a been been a pretty good ride ever since, you know. Uh, especially being native, and, and uh, English is just your second language. But anyway, um, so around age eleven, I started drawing this cartoon. Uh, well, doing these sketches um, of uh, uh, cartoons of things that I thought was funny. And then my best friend, David and I, uh, when we got to seventh grade at age 12, I, uh, we found ourselves in separate classrooms. And so um, we decided to start drawing cartoons of stuff happening in our respective classrooms. And uh, we would exchange notes, I mean, uh, cartoons while everybody else exchanged, you know, little notes, you know, in the hallway, David and I exchanged cartoons. And so I kept drawing in the military, I was in the Marine Corps. I drew then, I drew a couple of uh, cartoons for Stars and Stripes, which is the official military newspaper. And uh, I, I was pretty happy, you know, just having uh, my, my uh, work print in print. Um, I got on the Marine Corps, I, I had uh, the three kids and I raised them. And while, while when they got to the oldest was about age nine, I decided to take, uh, take these kids and go up back up towards Ignacio to Durango or uh, the Fort Lewis College. And I went back to school up there uh, because uh, by then I was a single father with these three kids in tow. And so I found out, wound up on the newspaper, college newspaper, and the Southern Ute tribe got wind of this popular cartoon that I drew called Fort Leisure uh, because we were at Fort Lewis and it was a cartoon about cartoon life. And so, um, they asked me if I could come up with a cartoon for that paper on the Southern Ute tribe, the same tribe that had the dormitory housing when I was in high school. And I said, of course I would. And they said, uh, do you mind making them native, native uh, characters? And I had never even thought of drawing any native characters for some reason. They were just uh, um, regular uh, cartoons, uh, which were, uh, what do you call those? Um, um, I hate it when I can't think of a word. Uh, when they're just ordinary, where they're not, um, ah, I can't, I'll remember the word later. Um, but anyway, uh, this is the first time I was asked to draw uh, uh, native cartoons. And I thought, how do I do that? I mean, without perpetrating the stereotype that Hollywood had has presented us with. And then I thought about it and I was like, I, well, I have no choice, you know, I have to draw them with braids and, uh, of course, brown skin and hold on, somebody's here. Oh, oh, in the, uh, 
Pai Rese no Shu. Sorry. Um, one of the kids came back from uh, from school and I just told him there's stuff to eat in the kitchen. Uh, so anyway, um, uh, where was I at? Oh, so so I did that and it was the loincloth and, and I, I was comfortable with the loincloth because I wear loincloths, you know, about seven to 20 times out of the year. For, for stuff that happens here and then the, and then and then I drew the chief which is one of the main characters and I have that on the wristband that I always wear this wristband and someone had made this for me but that's the chief and I felt comfortable drawing the chief because I grew up right next to uh, our chief here in the village and so my character is based on him and I had known him all my life and so and so with that I felt comfortable doing that. Uh, coming up with these characters and so uh, so it, was, it became very popular and when I finished school in 2006 by 2007 I wound up in the Santa Fe uh, New Mexican newspaper and like Liz said uh, uh, this is the only cartoon in the whole United States that's in a mainstream newspaper of the day and when I first started I started out down here in this little corner down here and then uh about four years later, they moved me to this corner down here. And about seven years ago, they moved me up here, this uh, left-hand corner. And as of four years ago, uh, they have moved me up to the top right, which is the pristine spot. And as, if you notice, it's the biggest uh, spot for than any of these cartoons, because these are strips. And this is a, always a single panel. And so, uh, I found out that this cartoon is the number one cartoon here in Santa Fe um, after they did a vote to, to get rid of uh, four or five cartoons because they wanted the print to be bigger. And so that's when I found out that my cartoon was three times bigger um, than uh, more popular than the number two cartoon, which was Peanuts. And you may have heard of Peanuts. But uh, the strange thing is, um, well, two, one is the, um, The 168 pages of hate mail I got when this first cartoon first came out and people were writing in that this cartoon's not funny, this cartoon's not drawn well, this cartoon is racist. And, uh, and uh, basically those are the three reasons. And so I wrote a universal letter back saying uh, uh, to address all of them, I, I simply introduced myself. My name is Ricardo Cate, I'm from Santo Domingo Pueblo and I draw this cartoon and I am Native American. And most of them wrote back and said, oh, you're native. Well, I guess it's okay then. And the other one is that, that, that it's so popular, but the, the readership, and there's about 70,000 people that read this uh, paper every morning, um, about 90% are non-native. And so when I heard about the popularity of this cartoon, that's when I realized I have something big here because I can do a lot of stuff with this, uh, with this cartoon, and whereas I can uh, uh, draw about native issues, native um, uh, lights, uh, just just anything that that I could that that normally isn't out there because we don't really have a voice. Or uh, back then, we didn't really have a voice, but all that changed with uh, Standing Rock, and uh, and that's where uh, I realized um, my. Uh, my contribution to that cause was really, really uh, cool. And, uh, and so uh, I just dropped off my uh, youngest daughter at Fort Lewis where she wound up graduating. And uh, she used to walk the halls with me back when she was just uh, five years old. But then uh, she, uh, I had dropped her off as a freshman. And when she was uh, um, unpacking her stuff, I, she, she put me on the internet and I'm just looking through, browsing through, and I start seeing this, all these stories about this, 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 uh, this pipeline up at Standing Rock. And what really got my interest was that uh, the pr first proposed um, um, site for the pipeline was it would run one mile north of the town of Bismarck. And the townspeople said, absolutely not, not. And they got to move the pipeline 26 miles south. And all of a sudden now it's one mile north of an Indian reservation. 
And all of a sudden, it was okay to do that. And that didn't sit well with me. And so I was telling Nicolette, I should go up there. And she goes, uh, why? I said, well, this, this seems like, a, you know, I'm, first of all, I'm interested, uh, see what's going on. And uh, you're my youngest and the other two are on their own. So I, I could just go. And so I did. On August 25th, I took off from Durango, Colorado, and uh, I wound up in uh, up at Cannonball uh, um, the next day, August 26th. And there I stayed until December 2nd. Uh, I was there for four months and, uh, oh my gosh, uh, I first arrived there, but I, I arrived with supplies. I put on Facebook and if you get on my Facebook page, uh, you'll, you'll see, if you go back to that, you can follow, uh, what I did from, from day one and, and, and everything. And that's the cool thing about Facebook. It's uh, it's actually, you can go back and, you know, there's this timeline of stuff that, that happens, but so anyway, I showed up and, uh, with supplies and uh, uh, I'm glad one of my friends, uh, Northern friends showed me how to approach the camp with respect and uh, delivering uh, gifts and, and, and all that, the, the proper way to, to, to enter the camp. And so, because uh, each tribe is different and uh, um, there's about 648 tribes and, and they're, they're all different. And so uh, that's one of the things I, I, I wanna make sure that is in my cartoon, and when I draw about another tribe, I make sure I get all their uh, their their things, how they do things, or how they sing, say things. I, I try to get that right. But anyway, I got up there, and uh, from day one, I started talking to to the four women that started that movement. It wasn't the men; uh, they had actually, I think, approved it, and and the three, four women. Uh, where the pipe woman was going through their land with LaDonna Orange. Uh, she was the main one with the most of the pipeline going through her place. And they said, absolutely not. And on April 1st of 2006, that, uh, 16, they started that, that, that movement, setting up camp and everything. And then people started coming. And by the time I got there, maybe there was about 1,500 of us. And by the time uh, Thanksgiving came around, there was maybe 10,000. But um. About the second, third day after listening to these stories and people who were there, I started drawing about these people and about uh, what I saw. And and uh, at first they had said uh, maybe they took out the Wi-Fi in that area so people couldn't um, uh, uh, send stuff from their phone. Uh, I don't know what the word is. But anyway, um, but I realized it was like kind of in a valley. So I went up to the highest point, there was this big hill and I stood up there and all of a sudden I got like four bars and I started um, um, uh, sending my cartoons out from there and putting them on my Facebook page. And then, uh, so that night I called that hill, I dubbed it Facebook Hill. And I put it in one of my cartoons. I put up the, the banners that they had put uh, different tribes that were there. And then I drew the hill and I have a have an arrow pointing that says Facebook Hill. and uh, and then uh, everybody started calling it Facebook Kill. So here I am drawing stuff that I see each day. And and, and I drew um, when, when, uh, um, when they still had the, the tie, the rip tie or tie, tie the cords, uh, that's all they carried. And then I drew on September 3rd when they unleashed the dogs on us on Labor Day weekend on a Saturday who works on a Saturday, right? It was all set up anyway. Uh, September 9th, when the um, um, riot gear came out, and then September 13th is when they started pointing the guns at us, and everything is all uh, uh, on my Facebook, and I came up with a book. Um, I don't, I couldn't find it, because um, every time I come out with a new set of uh, uh, books to, to print, boom, they, they, they go right away, and so uh but anyway, um, so I real soon realized that was my job out there because every time I posted someone something about Facebook and because um, um, Standing Rock uh, posts were very popular and here I was doing it in a cartoon format uh, with my drawings and uh, that gave me a, a little more, uh, uh, well, I guess a lot more readers that, that were um, uh, hearing about this, especially the, the people from who read the uh, Santa Fe newspaper 
because all my drawings became the, 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 the drawings that appeared in, in the paper. So here were 70,000 people plus native uh, uh, people who followed me um, who didn't get the paper. And all of a sudden I had this huge audience that I could uh, um, draw and, and inform them of stuff that was happening. And that was my contribution to this cause. And, and I realized how powerful humor um, really is because uh, although some of those cartoons aren't very humorous, uh, they did strike a, a chord, a huge chord with uh, people of my readership. And, and I was able to uh, um, um, relay all the happenings that were going on up there um, through through my drawings. And uh, after uh, Standing Rock, I came home to find that, um, you know, Bear's Ears was being, um, uh, uh, was under danger of, of, of being uh, shut down in uh, Chaco Canyon here in New Mexico, which was the, is the, the lands of my ancestors. Um, they were going to start fracking there. And so the stuff that I learned, the procedures I learned up at Standing Rock really helped here because here um, they were doing the same things they were doing up there. And uh, one of the meetings to stop the fracking at Chaco Canyon, we went down to the town of Bernalillo where uh, they had the, the, the commissioner, uh, the commission uh, on, on this. Uh, and we were going to go down there and protest. We were going to go into that room and, uh, you know, vote no on this issue and what did they do is they hired uh about 300 people to take up all the seats in there so we couldn't go in and we helplessly watched in another room on the screen um as they voted and uh the, the first uh, set of voting uh, went through and so the following week uh me and Doreen and a bunch of the people mustered up some people and uh, we showed up four hours early. So the next time we took up the seats and those people came again and, but we were already seated there. And so these little tricks that, 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 that I learned up in Standing Rock, uh, I was able to uh, uh, do them out here and, and uh, uh, we were able to halt, uh, well, slow it down, but at, uh, the help of Deborah Holland now uh, with the uh, she's with the Bureau of Indian Affairs uh, oh Secretary of the Interior um, I think we can manage to actually halt uh, the the fracking entirely and so uh, um, uh, I've been in contact with Deborah Holland and so we're uh, we're doing all that and so um, so I started drawing some some cartoons for the paper so people would be aware of what was going on and. Uh, We've got a lot of people who are going to be supporting us when it comes down to it, and so um, the art that I do and 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 the the, um, the issues I can draw about and 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 help help with um, is really really uh, it gives me a great sense of satisfaction and a um, uh, personal note is a uh, of mine is a. Uh, I, I want to delve into the <clears throat> murdered and missing indigenous women. Uh, uh, but I'm not ready yet because um, <clears throat> uh, I lost my daughter uh, back in March of <clears throat> 2019. Uh, she was murdered in Santa Fe. And so once I'm ready, I want to you know, get into that as well. But for now, um, I do what I can to um, uh, address Native issues, like, like, like uh, this is one of my more uh, popular ones. Um, I came out with this back in uh, September 2007 when I first started drawing. I mean, the father simply says, someday, son, none of this is going to, will be yours. And uh, I take a lot of stuff that, 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 that I read about, um, and, I, and everyone knows that. Um, that phrase where the father takes his son, some of day, and some of, someday all of this will be yours. And so I just twist the words around a little bit to make my point. And uh, I uh, so I started doing, doing cartoons about that and the immigration thing. And uh, they're out looking, and uh, she says, uh, um, 
we need to pass tougher immigration laws. Uh, that's another one that, that I have. And I paint these ones that a lot of people ask for. And so this was um, also drawn, drawn way back in 2010. And you know how people say, oh, Columbus didn't discover us, we discovered him. And, you know, everyone basically says the same thing, but um, I like to come at it at a different, you know, use a different approach. And uh, uh, so um, I drew this one, it's the first bank of the Americas. And uh, the guy informs, I'm sorry, Mr. Columbus, but your discover card application has been denied. And uh, I purposely draw, cut, <laughs> not Custer, Columbus to look like that, uh, uh, as silly as I can make him with the feather and the silly costume and uh, look what the native is wearing. And so to, to uh, um, how do I say, uh, to offset the, uh, uh, my dilemma of uh, drawing the uh, characters um, with the feathers and, and the loincloths and I, uh, I made them uh, more intelligent than their the, uh, uh, um, dominant society people. Uh, the chief and the general are my two main characters and they're very generic. Uh, even though he looks like Custer, I never gave him the name Custer. I just call him the general. And there's the chief. And I drew this during the balloon fiesta where the general looks out and says, oh, wow, from way up to land. And uh, there's really nothing funny about that, but it got people to talking about, you know, uh, the, the, the history of that. And so uh, I'm, I'm satisfied with uh, just getting people just, just to uh, talk about stuff. And there's even uh, 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 my cartoon jumps from 1800s all the way to present where diabetes is a huge thing with us natives. And here's one with a native visiting a doctor and the doctor asks him, does obesity run in your family? And the native says, no, nobody runs in my family. And uh, those are words that I actually spoke to with, the, uh, uh, with my doctor when I was diagnosed with uh, diabetes. And so uh, I have type two diabetes and when he first told me back in 2010, March of 2010, um, I was pretty distraught. And uh, I actually locked myself in my house for a week, um, thinking that you know life was over. And uh, But I did some research and it doesn't have to be over. And so instead, um, I was 248 pounds and uh, I lost, decided to lose a lot of weight. And so a lot of it came from being up at Standing Rock, but I am now at 160 and uh, I still run a lot. I, I uh, exercise when I can and, and I draw about uh, diabetes and, and not to make fun of it, but to you know make it uh, a little more hum humorous because I know there's a lot of people, especially natives that are, are faced with this, uh, with this disease. And, and, and being that I, as, that I have it, um, it makes me feel good that, that, uh, that my cartoons make people feel a little more, uh, I don't know if you, I wouldn't say happy, but um, like they, uh, they, they can beat this thing. And I try to, uh, on my Facebook page, to let people know that I, I'm, I'm beating this thing. I'm, you know, I, I'm not gonna let it control my life. And so through my drawings and through my actions, I, I, I try to do that. And so on a lighter note, I like having my cartoons, just simple everyday thing, remote control with the broomstick. That's my uncle Hubert, by the way. Um, and something like this, your Buffalo burger is gonna take longer than, ex than expected. Um, just random stuff that I like to draw about. And even a lot of people ask me how I come up with these ideas. And uh, they just come at me when, uh, to me, whenever, even just driving. Uh, a couple of years ago, I was out driving and I saw the sign expect delays. And this is the cartoon I came up with, just driving. This cowboy sees a sign and there's three natives behind the rock waiting for him. And uh, so, yeah, I get to be silly, you know, doing this. And, uh, and during this pandemic, 
um, the state of New Mexico, the Department of Health asked me for my help because here uh, in Santa Domingo, we're still on lockdown. Uh, we can't go and come and go as we please. We have to present a vaccination card in order to leave or come back into the village, which is really good. I really love that we've been doing this for a year and a half now. And uh, um, so basically we're practicing our sovereignty where we're able to do that. And so nobody has you know, really complained, uh, but um, so for the longest time, for over a year, the kids couldn't leave or anything. And so I was happy to help the state of New Mexico with this thing where they asked me to uh, do some cartoons about the pandemic and try to explain to the kids what was going on. And so I came up with this book, this coloring book. Uh, it's called Studis, Studis New Mexico, which is slang for let's do this. And it's uh, big on the internet with native people. And the two guys are looking at the smoke signal. One of them looks like the, uh, the uh, coronavirus and, and the guy simply says that doesn't look good. And uh, so that's the cover. And so in the, in the coloring book, I have all these cartoons that kids in, in, uh, in color. And it, a lot of it is the Pueblo setting. I switched from the plain videos to, to, to the, uh, my people's set, uh, Pueblo. So he says, good, you know, Water from the river. No, this is hand painting. And so uh, this this coloring book is is really really uh, um, really helped out a lot. Uh, these kids who are struggling uh, to uh, uh, remember, don't touch your face. And the kids like what face, Grandma? And uh, so this was distributed to all the. The tribes around uh, here in New Mexico for to, to children, and then all of a sudden uh, um, the, the Navajo Nation, like in Arizona, wanted some, and so we were able to ship some to them. And then uh, out in Oklahoma, some of the tribes wanted them, and so we were able to do that. And so uh, again, there's there's another uh, part of my uh, work as a contrib contribution to to help uh, people. Uh, who we're in need or just just to uh, deal with this, this this huge thing that we've been um, faced with for the last two years and so uh yeah i uh i guess that's all i have for now um uh this whole thing is ongoing and as long as i can draw as long as i can um do what i can to uh uh, uh to make a difference on this end, or if uh, if I'm needed somewhere else, um, to go out there and 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 uh, bring to uh, uh, the attention of more people, uh, whatever um, native issue that that is out there, I, I would love to keep doing this. Um, my kids are all grown. I'm I'm basically by myself now, and so I'm 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 good. I I can do this, and. Uh, I, I, I really appreciate being able to, to, to talk to uh, people or events like this to, to spread the word. And uh, um, I don't know what else. Uh, <sighs> but I learned that one individual can, can make a difference. And I hope uh, you guys realize it too. You don't have to be a cartoonist or um, just, you just need to show up. And uh, uh, our numbers are needed. If, if uh, anything, if I learn anything uh, from, it, it's, it's just, just show up and then ask what you can do, whatever cause it is, whatever um, plight. Um, uh, I know this kind of lame advice, but it's pretty simple. Just, just show up. And so that's all I've been doing. Um, like I said, I, I want to help out some more. I want to, uh, um, I want to help out the MMWI, uh, I, IW. Um, but again, like I said, I, I'll I'll start that when I'm ready. And uh, there's a lot to be done, and so I'm <clears throat> glad to be able to do that through my art. And so, uh, I guess for the next few minutes, I can take some questions. Thank you. Thank. Thank you so much, Ricardo. And uh, 
I don't think just showing up is uh, is is too simple at all. It can be really the hardest thing to do sometimes, and and that's what we we try really hard to do up here. Um, I, it must be hard for a humorist to not have a live audience uh, when you're when you're showing some of your cartoons. So I just wanted to tell you how um, uh, how it, it, funny and and wonderful and poignant the ones that you showed us were, and um, and it made me think to ask, um, obviously humor is kind of a, a superpower of yours to, uh, it, that affects people in the world in, in so many ways. And are there some some moments in your, your life growing up that struck you uh, as, as key points in developing your sense of humor and irony and, and the realization that you could, you could reach people in this special way? No, I, I I could be like all dramatic and say yes. There was a time when no, I was just I was just being a kid, and I I just I just loved drawing. I I had no idea what I was gonna do. Although, when I was age eleven, I'm sitting at the kitchen table. My younger brother, Kenneth, walks by. He's three years younger. He goes, "What are you doing?" And I'm like, and I'm writing my name. I uh, uh, front and back about seven pages of my name, and I said, "I'm practicing." He goes, practicing what? I said, uh, I'm practicing my signature. I'm going to be famous someday. And he just kind of scoffs and walks off. And so every year after that, he would he would ask me sarcastically, so when are you going to be famous? And, uh, <laughs> and he's got his first, uh, about, a, about six months ago, we we're outside of Walmart. And this lady stops me and I, uh, up in Santa Fe. She goes, are you Ricardo Cate? She goes, yeah. And my brother was with me. And she's like, uh, can you sign my receipt? And then four other people stopped. And now I'm out there in the parking lot signing Walmart receipts. And because these people were like, really like, uh, uh, I don't know, uh, what's that? Some starstruck? And they were like, oh my gosh, it's you. And, my, and, and the best part was my brother actually witnessing this um, from, uh, from age 11 to, to who we are now. And, and he was like, oh, wow, you know, it's a, uh, Something cool about you know uh, um, uh, having your brother realize he was wrong. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, very very satisfying. I guess he had to had to apologize. Yeah, satisfying. Fun of you after all those years. <laughs> Uh, you're you're so well known for your devotion to kids uh, and uh, dropping everything uh, to do anything you can to help youth and kids and and I was I was wondering if if you could talk a little bit about obviously kids love cartoons too and the, and that's it that's a huge tool in your COVID book we, we're getting a lot of things in the chat about folks um, uh, really loving the the COVID book that, that you did for kids is there something in your in your teaching or your mentoring or interaction with kids that that kind of uh, draws on and plays into um, your your cartoon uh, art and humor well it comes in handy but it's funny you ask that because there's another um thing that I do that actually helped me more in the classroom and that's filmmaking I I have a I used to have this uh, great um, video camera and uh, and so I set it up, up in my classroom a lot and so um, to to record the kids of some of the things that I did with them like playing Pictionary with uh, with vocabulary words um, so that they're not as boring to do um, remember how we used to have to write them 10 20 times each you know, and find the, the definition and all that boring, right? But you play a Pictionary game from that, then, then it becomes a great game and kids are yelling and excited and everything. And so what I did once with the, um, uh, with the uh, Constitution, I was teaching seventh, eighth grade so uh, social studies. Seventh graders were learning about New Mexico history and eighth graders were learning about US government. And so when we got to the uh, Constitution, part of the Constitution, I decided to put up this uh, um, contest and I told him Friday, I want you to go home, uh, memorize the preamble to the constitution. And when you come back, the first person to recite the re preamble gets this $20 bill and I held it up and the kids got all excited. So of course they went home, they all learned it. And so Monday morning comes around and uh, for some reason, I, I, I was just a substitute teacher, but then I went back to school to teach and um, because as a substitute, I had this, I found I had this knack 
for talking to kids and not belittling them or talking, uh, just, just being on the same level with them. And they knew kids know when you're honest or not, if you're the real thing. And so uh, kids were just kind of drawn to me. And so uh, I realized that's what I wanted to do. And so, um, so the kids came back. And so the first thing I asked, who doesn't want to do this? Because there's, I don't, I never want to make anyone do what I wouldn't want to do. And so about eight kids put up their, raise their hands, you know, like this. And so I said, well, you guys sit up here. So they got to sit up front and the eager kids got to line up. And I said, okay, we're going to start this, but uh, there's only one rule. I told them, uh, I held up the $20 bill. First person writes who cite this, but the only rule is you have to do it in one breath. What? <laughs> so there was, a, so they had a, a new thing. And so I turned on the camcorder, which I got permission from all the parents that I was going to be doing this. And so, uh, oh my gosh, it turned out to be hilarious because the kids would start off with, we the people of the United States in order to form more perfume and establish justice, ensure domestic tranquility, provide for the common defense. Uh, and, and they couldn't finish. And it wasn't until two o'clock that afternoon one kid finally did it and uh and so um about a month later uh, there was this uh, school board meeting and one of the teachers had seen the video and she was laughing so hard she's decided to take it to the school board meeting i don't i didn't like my school board so i i went to one or two of them and i caused some mischief down there and so so i never wanted to attend another one so i gave her the tape and so she went and showed it and uh, Jackie Chan happened to be filming up at Rio Rancho and uh, they were asking permission to, I think use the school or uh, school grounds or something to shoot a scene. And so uh, he saw the clip and uh, next day I get a phone call. Jackie Chan wants me to bring four students to, uh, uh, to his film site up in Rio Rancho. And so I went and then we go right after we watched him for an hour, he takes us to this other house, a couple doors down. And there were channel four, channel seven, channel 13, uh, all three, ABC, NBC, and CBS, um, the channels were there. And he comes out with this big ceremonial uh, $10,000 check for my school district to buy more film equipment to do what I was doing. And then I got to talk to Jackie Chan for about 15 minutes, the, the, the guy, told us you got 15 minutes to talk to Jackie Chan so here I am talking to him and he's only 5'5 five, five. I'm 5'7 five, so he's like right here and I gave him uh, this painting of uh, uh, um, I don't know if I have it no, I don't have it fast food and he's looking at it he goes is this me because he had played an Indian in a previous movie I go yeah not you and he starts telling me I'm not that done and he's, and he's hard to understand so I'm standing there listening to him but all the while I'm thinking, because he's like this short, I'm thinking as I'm looking at him, trying to listen. And I go in my head, I can take this guy, right? <laughs> I mean, that's that's my way, that's my weird way of, you know. <laughs> so I didn't do anything because he had bodyguards and stuff. So, yeah. You know. but yeah, it's 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 uh, it's cool. I, I, I really enjoy teaching. However, in 2009, um, the way my government works as uh, 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 the men who run the government, uh, about 32 a year, we are appointed just out of the blue in uh, late December and that we'll be uh, uh, running the, our, our tribe for the next year. And so you have to drop everything. And uh, it comes as a shock. Well, it shouldn't because you can be picked any time, but, but still uh, to drop everything you're doing for a whole year for this honor of, of serving your community well and it is an honor um i i didn't feel any way about it thinking oh crap you know i i was very honored however i had to uh, stop teaching and then um when i got back the year after i had already been replaced but the good thing is my book had come out i have a book on amazon called uh uh, without reservations the cartoons of ricardo contain you can get it on amazon um uh, the book had come out, and uh, I, I've just been doing this ever since. Uh, I, I started painting after that, uh, going to book signings, and, and then and then all of a sudden I started getting all these a uh, year and a half ago these webinar thingies. And uh, but before this, I got to uh, 
before the pandemic, I got to do com two commencement addresses at colleges. And then I got to speak at uh, Virginia Tech and Yale. And uh, so I did a webinar with Ohio, Ohio State, the Ohio State uh, <laughs> last week. They kept telling me, make sure you say the Ohio State. And I was like, what? Make sure you say the Ohio State. About 20 people told me, and it was driving me nuts. And so when someone tells me to do something, I don't do it. And so I went on, and the first thing I said, hi, my name is, uh, oh, uh, thank you, Ohio State. I didn't say the Ohio State. I said, Ohio State, my name is Ricardo Cate, the Ricardo Cate. <laughs> so that was fun. <laughs> uh, but anyway, uh, okay, yeah, I hope that answered your question. I know I, sometimes I ramble. That's the best way. No, absolutely. That was fantastic. And I, I wanted to give to uh, give a shout out to you and, and to Rebecca Hammond, who, who had to drop off. But uh, for, for the folks who might not have been been here in the beginning, um, uh, Rebecca or Becky is uh, in charge of our American Indian Outreach. She is a Ute Mountain Ute tribal member. She's amazing. And she spent the whole day teaching uh, uh, fourth through sixth graders from uh, Southern Ute who came over to um, to our campus to learn about uh, Ute history and um, Native American culture in, in the Four Corners. She's an amazing teacher, much beloved, uh, probably for the same reasons that kids uh, love you, Ricardo, is that she is definitely um, no bull and they, they, they can sense that. So I know that that uh, Becky and I really also appreciated your your stories about your work with Southern Ute and 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 Fort Lewis uh, over there too. It was it's kind of a, a fun coincidence that that was what we had going on today uh, on campus. We're we're getting um, a bunch of questions uh, about um, Native social justice uh, and causes uh, important to Indigenous people and communities. Um, uh, I'm sure that you have a, a pretty large non-native following as well, and and we do on our on our webinars here and, and our programs at Kirk Canyon. And the general gist of the of the questions um, is, you know, uh, what what can you do? What can we do um, uh, as as non-native allies to be able uh, to support uh, causes other than the the show up, which uh, absolutely is is the foundation of that. But if there was anything else that you wanted to talk about for the folks that are asking well I, I found out i found that you know just be informed and don't uh always uh pay so much attention on on on, on, on social media um and like i said um i saw the stories uh about standing rock but a lot of it didn't make sense to me so i had to go and find out for myself and and see what was going on so uh i would say to be informed, but but make sure uh, the 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 um, where you get the information from is 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 uh, uh, is the real deal because um, there's a lot of misleading stuff out there, and so I'm I'm glad I was able to go and see firsthand what was going on, and so um, and so when I said show up, I don't necessarily mean you know show up and do this, but show up and 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 you know get be more informative uh and get more information uh real information about what's going on uh do some readings from uh not from the computer but um maybe uh listen to uh um <laughs> i i want to say news but uh even that is kind of iffy right now uh, definitely don't watch fox news but um <laughs> but bbc bbc has been pretty good and and uh i love listening to that and so i uh um, I listen to a lot of public radio, and I'm also a radio uh, DJ here as well. And I have my own show at KSFR. And if you follow me on Facebook, you'll you'll see when when I have my next show. And I basically they just give me two hours, and I basically go on and I go. Uh, this is what happens when you give an Indian a radio show, and I just talk about whatever, <laughs> play whatever I want. And so it's kind of a cool, unique show because. One song they'll be you'll be listening to the San Juan Turtle Dance, then you'll be listening to Cindy Lauper, and then Redbone, and then the Apache Spirit Dance, and it's just a mixture of stuff that I like. And so, um, anyway, but just 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 be informed, and uh, uh, and and uh, a lot of the stuff that's going on at different places, you need to know the history of those places as well because that really has a big, big effect on the, 
uh, uh, why people are angry, why you know this is going on, and so uh, so so if anything, you know, learn the history of uh, whatever is going on, wherever it's going on, and so uh, that's that's it. I've I've always been inquisitive. I've always been you know curious about stuff, and uh, ever since I was a kid, and so if, you know I. I must have taken apart seven toasters and about 15 radios just because, and, you know, uh, they weren't mine. They were my siblings, but, and my mom's stuff, but, you know, I was always questioning stuff. And so, uh, so I'm still exactly the same way, I guess. So my mom just found out yesterday, by the way, that all those uh, rolling pins that she lost were made into nunchucks back, <laughs> back when I was six. <laughs> So. <laughs> well, perfect. And we're right about it at five o'clock here. And as always, you want to be respectful of Ricardo's time. Thank oh, no, you it's so okay. much. For... I want to show you guys something that I came oh, up okay, with. Okay, good. You have, have some parting parting thoughts? <laughs> well, yeah, I um, it, it's, it's just, um, you can't get this anymore unless I order some. But if you go on my website, you'll see them. I came out with these MAGA hats. <laughs> Those, those have been seen on our campus, uh, the, on the staff. <laughs> those are fantastic. Oh, really? Wow. That's yeah, cool. Yeah. <laughs> this one I saved for myself because, uh, again, they went pretty fast. But right yeah. now, um, the, the calendars are, are the really big thing right now. And uh, so, um, yeah, if you guys can get online, order the calendar. Uh, they're all signed by me. And uh, next thing we're coming out is with this T-shirt. If you go on my... Um, um, on the uh, ah, Facebook page back a few months ago uh, just at the beginning of summer I made up this t-shirt with the chief smoking and the and the smoke comes out and the letters come out and it, it and it says white lies matter and uh, so I decided to make that into a t-shirt so that'll be coming soon and so I'm I, I'm just trying to stay busy and uh, oh here's another one it was just laying here, but I'll just share it with you. The guy says, oh my God. I love it. So, yeah. Thank you so much. We've got, so Taylor put in the chat all of the links where you can buy calendars and, and check out all of Ricardo's works and follow him on Facebook. And, and we really hope to, to get you up here to, uh, to the Four Corners one of these days to, to come and, and visit with us and our students too. Oh, that'd be, I, would, I would love to do that. So yeah, just, just let me know. And we're, you know, you have my information, so. Absolutely. Thank you so much, Ricardo, and thank you everybody for joining us. Okay, thank you.